so sure. We followed him. Believed in him. And they took him away. And in an instant, everything changed. We saw him tried. Without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, our friend.
Church, how are we doing? Welcome to North Point Community Church. We're so glad you're here. Hope you're having a great Easter weekend so far. And we're going to sing today about the fact that Jesus is alive. And it's okay to act like Jesus is alive. And it's okay to sing like Jesus is alive. And it's okay to shout and worship like Jesus isn't in the grave anymore. He walked out of the grave fully alive and offers his life to you and to me today and every single day. We're gonna sing together this one phrase, rescued, redeemed. We're alive, we're forgiven. It goes like this. Rescued, redeemed, we're alive. Is 
Wow. Well, happy Easter, everybody. Hey, just stay standing right where you are. I'm only going to be up here a few minutes. If you're watching online right now, I hope there's a lot of energy wherever you are because it is crazy up in here right now. Does it feel as crazy out there as it does right here? Because it is wild. Hey, uh, if you're brand new here, we just want to say a happy Easter to you. If you've never been to North Point before, maybe it's been a long time since you've been in a church and there's a little more energy in here than there was maybe the last time you were here. I don't know, or the last time you were in whatever church you were in. We just want you to know what the fuss is all about because Easter really does have a lot of fuss to it. And we believe it should. My name's Clay, by the way. I'm one of the pastors here. We're about to sing a song that I want to just give a little bit of context to because I think it really, really matters. The song is called Jesus Paid It All. It was a song that was written in 1865, so it's been around for a long, long time, but maybe it's the first time you've ever sung it. And I want to answer a question that is a really important question that this song begs, which is what is it? Jesus paid it all. What's it? When I was uh, in graduate school, I'll tell you a real quick story. I was in graduate school and, and I was staying with this family that was really wealthy. I was a poor graduate student. Uh, being poor is a difficult thing, but being in graduate school, trying to pay for school, I had this family that was wonderful, very wealthy. They lived in Highland Park, Texas, which is super nice. It's this million dollar home. I was so grateful to be living there. And I, I heard something in their half bath that was broken with the toilet. And I have an engineering degree, which I never should use. And so I thought, well, I sh I'll try to fix it. And so I picked up the, the lid on the tank and it was so heavy because I'd never experienced such a nice toilet. I dropped it on the toilet and it shattered and broke everywhere. And I just ran and I've never talked to that family. I've never spoken to them since then. So kidding. Uh, but I did think in that moment, this is broken and I can't fix it. And as silly as that is, Every one of us can relate because we all know there's something inside of us that's broken that we cannot fix. And what Jesus did on the cross is he, he paid for those things that are broken in us that we've tried to fix. We've tried to white knuckle it and, and do better and say we're going to be on time next time and try to fix our addictions and mend our behavior. And he says enough with that. I have paid for the very thing you can't fix. And his resurrection allows us the ability to actually be victorious over the things that hold us back. And I think that's worth celebrating. I think it's worth saying, hey, praise to the one who paid for the thing in me that's broken that I can't fix. And so let's just lift up that huge chorus that says, praise the one. God, we give you praise because you are great for fixing what we cannot fix on our own. So I hope you'll sing it out with us, join in on this huge part. It's a massive song, but it's worth a lot. So lift up your voices, lift up your heart, lift up your hands, and lift up your head to the God who fixes what we can't fix, pays for what we can't pay for. Let's go. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life
complete. Jesus died, my soul to save. My life is just a You see, come on. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He did what I saw. Sin had left a crimson stain. He was. In white as snow, he washed in white as snow. He washed in white as snow. Jesus makes all things new. Jesus takes shame away. Jesus brings life. Jesus beat death. them that you'd let them know that you love them like crazy and that there's nothing that we can mess up in our past there's nothing that we can mess up during the week that you can't redeem and repair thank you that you are a shame fighter you're a healer you're a forgiver you're a life giver for everyone in this room everyone listening there is hope and the fact that you conquered death is the massive eternal exclamation point on anything that the enemy could deal with us anything that could be put upon us but you take all of our lives, God, in our ears and our hearts and allow us to hear what you wanna to say to us specifically today. Thank you that you paid our debt and raised our life from the dead. We'll forever say thank you on this earth and all eternity for what you've done. In your name we pray, amen. Awesome, you guys can be seated. We're gonna receive our offering at this time. We've got some volunteers that are gonna be walking through the aisles to help us do so.
So um, if you aren't a Christian or you're not a Jesus follower, and I really like the phrase Jesus follower better than Christian because Christian's so loaded with so many things these days. But if you, if you aren't a Christian or you aren't a Jesus follower or you used to be or you just lost interest or whatever the situation was, I have a feeling that if you came up here and told us why, we would all say, oh yeah, we get that. If we'd heard what you'd heard, been experienced what you've experienced, um, been treated by Christians maybe the way that you've been treated by Christians, grew up in the family you grew up in, grew up in the church that you grew up in, or just had been, you know, just not exposed to Christianity, whatever your reason for not being a Christian or not following Jesus, I think if we heard it, we would go, oh yeah, totally get that. Certainly not gonna judge you for that. But if you were to say to me, one-on-one, -on -one, if you were to say, Andy, okay, I'm not a Christian, I'm not a Jesus follower, I'm gonna let you take your best shot at convincing me to follow Jesus. In other words, you invited me into this conversation. I didn't like find you and grab you by the shoulders and spin you around. But if you said, okay, you know, I'm not a Jesus follower, I'm not a Christian, I don't know that I believe all that stuff, and you know, based on my experience, I'm not all that interested. But Andy, I'm gonna give you one shot to try to convince me to consider Jesus. And you were to give me that opportunity Here's what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't try to defend the history of the church because the church has done some really goofy things and there's some really embarrassing, not just weekends of church history, but seasons of church history. And I wouldn't try to defend the things that a lot of Christians have said or the ways that Christians have treated you. I wouldn't try to defend some of the values that certain Christians have or the way certain Christians talk or the way certain Christians treat certain people. And I wouldn't try to convince you with the Bible. I wouldn't say, well, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, because, and this is so important, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians before there was a Bible. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians long before there was a Bible, so I wouldn't start with that. If you were to give me one opportunity to try to convince you to consider being a Jesus follower, I would start with the event that we are celebrating together this weekend. I would start with the resurrection of Jesus. But once again, I wouldn't start with the Bible. And this is so important to know. There were tens of thousands of people that believed Jesus rose from the dead long before there was a Bible. In fact, people be started believing Jesus rose from the dead the morning Jesus rose from the dead. And when Jesus rose from the dead, this is important, when Jesus rose from the dead, the people in the vicinity of Jerusalem and Judea, they did exactly what you would have done if you had seen someone die, knew where they were buried, and then had breakfast with him on the beach a few days later. They took to social media. They did. They took to social media, the first century social media, which was they began talking about it and they began to write about it. They began to talk about it and they began to write about it. That's why I can say this. We believe Jesus rose from the dead, not because the Bible says so, because so many people believe Jesus rose from the dead long before there was a Bible. We believe Jesus rose from the dead because of the social media. Because a man named Matthew, who was a Jesus follower and one of Jesus' disciples, after the resurrection sat down and wrote out an entire account of Jesus' life, and he was an eyewitness. And then there was a guy named Mark, who was probably a Greek, who knew the disciples, and he sat down and he wrote out an entire, uh, an entire chronological account of the life of Jesus based on the eyewitnesses. And there was a guy named Luke, and he also sat down, and at the very beginning of what we call the Gospel of Luke, Luke starts this way. He said, I have decided and I have endeavored to write an orderly account of all the things that have happened here in our Midst. And then there's a guy named John that you've heard of. John was one of Jesus' disciples as well. And John was an eyewitness of everything. John stared into an empty tomb. And after the resurrection, as he became an old man and realized that he needed to write these things down, John wrote an account of the life of Jesus. And then there was Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' disciples. Peter wrote letters to the church. And all of these men, obviously from their writings, believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And then there was perhaps the most strange uh, illustration of this at all, perhaps the, the one that is the most compelling, and that's James. James was the brother of Jesus. And as you may have heard me say before, what would it take for your brother to convince you that he was the son of God? And the interesting thing is, James is not a Jesus follower when, J when Jesus is alive. But after the resurrection, James shows up, and James shows up as one of the leaders in the first century church, and he wrote a letter, he wrote a letter, and in this letter, it's very obvious that James, the brother of Jesus, came to the conclusion that his brother was his Lord, his Savior, and that his brother, Jesus, rose from the dead. 
And then there's a guy named the Apostle Paul. When I was in college, I went to Georgia State University. I took an ancient history class because I had to. And in this ancient history class, when we got to the first century, my professor at Georgia State University made the following statement. And this type of statement is made in universities all over the country and all over the world, and it's true. He said the Apostle Paul had more to do with the development of and the spread of Christianity than any other person in the ancient world. His point was, everybody believed there was a man named Paul that we know as the Apostle Paul who traveled around the Mediterranean Rim and planted all these churches and the Apostle Paul absolutely believed that Jesus Christ physically, literally rose from the dead. So we don't believe it because the Bible says so. It's way better than that. We believe it because these men who lived in the first century that knew Jesus and either were eyewitnesses of or knew eyewitnesses of, they all wrote about it. But there's another guy that I would, I would say to you if we were having a conversation across the table that you should consider as you decide whether or not Jesus is worth considering. And it's this guy, Nero. Now, all of you have heard of Nero. Um, if I were to ask you to list all the Roman emperors that you know, you could probably list maybe three, unless you're like me, who likes to read about this kind of stuff all the time. But very few people in our modern day know much about Roman emperors, but almost everybody's heard about Nero. Now, you don't know any law that he passed. You don't know any wars that he won. You don't know who his famous mother was. You don't know who he followed as an emperor. You probably don't know who followed him. But almost everybody knows two things about the emperor Nero. And what an interesting thing it is that these are the two things that almost everybody knows. I'll tell you the first one, you tell me the second one. The first thing that almost everybody knows about Nero is that he burned down the city of Rome. The second thing almost everybody knows is that he blamed the, the Christians. Now this is just history, this isn't in the Bible, this isn't re referenced in the Bible. But everybody knows it's just history that he, Nero burnt the city of Rome and he decided to blame it on a group of people and he blamed it on the Christians and a persecution against the Christians broke out and Nero you know, flamed the, you know, fanned the flames of this persecution against Christians. Now here's a really important question. And if we were sitting across the table from each other and I was trying to get you to consider Christianity, I would ask you this question. I would say, do you know why Nero could persecute Christians in Rome 30 years after the resurrection? Because this persecution broke out against these Christians in Rome 30 years after the resurrection. Now, this is why this is important. A lot of people have studied how long it takes for a myth to develop or legend to develop or fable to develop. And a myth, a legend, a fable is essentially something happened and over time it gets exaggerated and exaggerated and exaggerated to the point where people believe something that never happened but it's kind of based on something that sort of happened. And study after study have concluded that it takes a minimum, it takes a minimum of about 40 years, but actually usually it takes more like 60 to 80 years for something to become a legend that people believe. And the reason it takes so long is because all the people who were eyewitnesses of the original event have to be what? They have to be dead, exactly, they have to be dead. So the interesting thing is this, this is just history, this isn't Bible study. History tells us that when Nero was looking for a group of people to blame for the burning of Rome, there were thousands of Christians in the city of Rome, thousands of Christians in the city of Rome, most of whom were Roman citizens in the city of Rome who believed Jesus rose from the dead. So the answer to the question is simply this. There were thousands of Christians who believed Jesus rose from the dead in the city of Rome. The reason he could blame them is because they were there. And this was long before there was a Bible. Now here's why I say that. Because in college and in higher education and in culture, people are quick to say, well, you know, that whole Jesus thing, you know, it, it was all fabricated, it was all made up. People copied things and they miscopied things. And as time went on, the legend got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they decided Jesus rose from the dead, but Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And I don't believe in a resurrection. I don't believe it was possible. But the problem is simply this. We don't believe it because the Bible says it. We'll get to that in a minute. We believe it because the people who were there wrote about it. We believe it because within 30 years, there were thousands of Christians, not in Jerusalem, not in Judea, not in modern day Israel, in Rome, 1,500 miles away, that believed Jesus rose from the dead. And if there were thousands of people in Rome 30 years after the resurrection, that meant there were thousands of people there 20 years 
after the resurrection. There were hundreds of people there 10 years after the resurrection. That when you do the math and you look at the timeline, it's virtually impossible, in fact, it is impossible to conclude that there had been enough time for this myth to have grown to the point where people would believe in a resurrection, especially so far away from Jerusalem. So, if we were to sit down and I were to try to convince you to consider Jesus, I wouldn't start with the Bible and I wouldn't start with the church and I would not try to defend the behavior and the attitudes of some Christians. I would begin with the people who were there and what they said and what we know from history. So here's what happened. As time went on, people got these documents and they got these accounts of Jesus' life and they were so precious. And so they meticulously began to copy these because imagine if you had a copy or even a fragment or just one story from the life of Jesus, how valuable that would be to you. So they were copied and copied and then as time went on, they were gathered together and there would be copies of Paul's letters over here and there would be a gospel of Luke and a gospel of Matthew over here. And as time went by and as these documents were copied, they were eventually gathered together And then somebody put them together and they called it eventually the New Testament. But the phrase New Testament doesn't show up for about 200 plus years after the resurrection. And then somebody had the bright idea and this was so offensive to Jewish people and if you're Jewish, you should, I I can understand why you would still be offended by this. Somebody had the bright idea, we don't know who, to take the Jewish scriptures, we call it the Old Testament, but it's not old to Jewish people, it's their scriptures. To take the Jewish scriptures and to combine them with the Christian scriptures and then to put a big piece of leather around it and call it the Bible. But that didn't happen for hundreds of years after the resurrection. So we don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead because the Bible tells me so. It is way better than that. We believe it because Matthew told us, and Mark told us, and Luke told us, and John told us, and Peter told us, and James told us, and the Apostle Paul tells us, and we know there were thousands and thousands of Christians just a few years after the resurrection. So it's a bigger deal than a lot of people think, and it is a very, very difficult deal to simply dismiss because of some crazy idea that it took a long, long time for the resurrection myth to develop. No, it didn't. Now, that's kind of interesting, but the truth is Christians aren't gathered all over the world this weekend to simply celebrate the fact of the resurrection. The thing that makes us so excited, the reason we sing the way we do and the reason we gather the way we do is because of the implications of the resurrection. That when we fully understand the resurrection and we take seriously the death of Jesus on our behalf, it really does create a context for our lives that impacts every single element and every single facet of our lives. It impacts the way we spend our time. It impacts who we spend our time with. It impacts how we entertain ourselves. It impacts how we spend our money. It impacts how we mourn. It impacts how we love. And on Easter morning, on Easter morning, there is an exchange between Jesus and one of his followers that is so precious, that is so powerful, it is so tearful, it is so emotional. I think it captures the energy and it captures the implications of what it means to be someone who lives their life believing that Jesus rose from the dead. And so I wanna tell you that story. But first, a little context, okay? So here's the context. As you may know, ancient Jews believed that eventually God was gonna send a Messiah or a deliverer to Israel to restore the nation of Israel to the grandeur and the glory of when King David was king or perhaps even King Solomon. And year after year went by and century after century went by and no Messiah. There were some wannabe messiahs. There were some people who tried to be the messiah. There were people that they thought would be the messiahs and they were generally political leaders or military leaders, but it never panned out. And also running around in the background of ancient Jewish leaders was this idea. 2000 years, hard for us to get our mind around this. 2000 years before Jesus, Jewish people believed that God had made a man named Abraham a promise. And the promise that God made to Abraham was this. Abraham, you're gonna have a family that's gonna become a nation and your nation family is gonna bless all the nations of the earth. Now let me tell you how ridiculous this was. Nations in ancient times did not bless other nations. They conquered other nations, they enslaved other nations, they raided other nations and they stole from other nations but no nation had ever blessed another nation. In fact, in modern times, when have you ever heard of a nation 
blessing another nation. There are exceptions to that, but for the most part, nations conquer other nations. Nations use other nations. Nations try to get things from other nations. But God said to Abraham, your family is going to become a nation, and through that nation, every nation on the earth is going to be not conquered, not subdued, not enslaved, blessed. So ancient Jewish people had these two ideas that one day there will be a Messiah and one day God is going to use the nation of Israel to somehow impact the rest of the world. Fast forward to the first century and the nation of Israel is under the, under the foot and under the heel of Rome. Rome is the big dog and the city of Rome was considered the eternal city and the empire of Rome that had just become an empire was considered the eternal empire. And the nation of Israel was not gonna bless any other nations because the nation of Israel in the first century, they couldn't even bless themselves. And it seemed like that was a promise that God would never ever fulfill to the Jewish people and then the strangest of all strange men walked out of the Jordan River Basin. We know him as John the Baptizer or John the Baptist. And John smelled funny and he ate funny and he looked funny and he dressed funny and thousands and thousands of people went out to hear John preach. And the religious leaders were nervous. They were nervous because there was a crowd, but they were nervous because they perhaps they thought perhaps, could this be the Messiah? He does not look like a Messiah. He does not smell like a Messiah. He does not talk like a Messiah. He does not eat like a Messiah. And they went to see John the Baptist and they said, are you the one? We hope not. And he said, the good news is I'm not the one. I've come to prepare the way for the one. And then there's this dramatic scene in the Gospels where John the Baptist is baptizing in the Jordan River. And if, you know, when they make movies of these things, there's a dozen people here, there, some kids making a sandcastle. But the New Testament says that all of Jerusalem and all of Judea went to hear John the Baptist preach. There were thousands of people. And John is preaching and he looks up knee deep in water and he sees Jesus. And he has everyone turn their attention to Jesus because this is why John came. And he said, behold, not the politician, not the king, not the warrior, not the soldier, not the lion. He says, behold, the lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And folks, Jesus of Nazareth stepped onto the pages of history and the world has never been the same. And Jesus began to preach and he preached with such extraordinary authority and he began to teach and he taught in rhymes and he taught in parables and sometimes he was crystal clear. And the, the religious leaders tried to trick him and trap him because as Jesus began to teach, if they thought John the Baptist crowds were big, Jesus crowds were even larger. And it made the Romans nervous and it made the religious leaders jealous. And they tried time after time after time to separate the crowds from Jesus. And Jesus would look at the religious leaders and he would face them down and he would answer their gotcha questions. And one day he said, you realize that most of you are such hypocrites and most of you are such whitewashed tombs that even though the people respect you, most of you religious leaders are going to hell. And that was almost the last straw. But the last straw was when Jesus actually raised a man from the dead and it was a man that everybody knew. He was a famous wealthy man from the town, the village of Bethany. And when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the crowd went absolutely wild and the crowd began to grow and to grow and to grow. And the leaders of the temple realized this is the final straw. If we don't do something, they said, the entire world will believe in him. So Jesus was betrayed by a friend. Remember that story? And Jesus was condemned by the temple. And Jesus was ultimately crucified by the empire. And then he was buried by two men that would never publicly associate with him while he was alive. Two men went to Pilate, because in those days, if you were crucified, you were not allowed to be buried. Nobody could bury your body. The body was taken down off the cross, put in a wagon, taken down to the Valley of Gehenna, and burned or left to rot. But from time to time, people would go to the, the um, governor and usually bribe him to give them the body. So these two wealthy men who would never publicly identify with Jesus, they were secret followers, they go to Pilate and they probably bribed Pilate, but they got permission to take the body of Jesus. And as the sun was setting and as the Sabbath was about to begin, they quickly prepared his body for burial, put him in a tomb, sealed the tomb and left. And on that day, on the day that Jesus was crucified, this is so important, and if I were talking to you over the table and trying to convince you to consider Jesus, I would say, don't miss this. On the day that Jesus died, when Jesus was crucified, 
everybody unfollowed Jesus. There were no Jesus followers after the crucifixion, and here's why. It's not that they didn't appreciate what he taught. It's not that he didn't make a lot of, he didn't say a lot of memorable things and tell a lot of memorable stories. The problem with Jesus was Jesus claimed too much about himself. And when Jesus died, it undermined everything Jesus taught about himself. He said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, the way, the truth, and the life can't die. He said that I am the resurrection and the life. Well, if you are the resurrection and the life, you cannot die. He claimed to be the son of man. He inferred that he was the son of God. He inferred that he was God's chosen person. And he tipped his hat to the fact that he was probably God's Messiah. But Messiahs can't be crucified. The son of man can't be killed. And the son of God isn't going to allow himself to be buried. So when Jesus was crucified and died, even though people had extraordinarily high hopes, even though he had healed the sick, everybody's faith in Jesus vanished. There were no Christians after the crucifixion. There were no Jesus followers after the crucifixion. The game was over. There was nothing to hold on to. There was no movement to keep alive. There was no message worth repeating because Jesus said too much about himself. And then he allowed himself to be taken into custody, convicted, tried and crucified. So there was no one outside the tomb counting down from 10 on Easter morning. And the interesting thing is, and again, if you, were, if you were allowing me to try to convince you, I would remind you of this. In the gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, what Peter wrote, what James wrote, what the apostle Paul wrote, nobody wrote themselves into the story as a hero. You see, if you're making this up, somebody would write themselves in as the hero. No one else believed, but I believed. No one else was there to see when he came out of the tomb, but I was there. But every single narrative and every single person that has anything to do with the story of Jesus, they all admit, none of us believed he was coming back. None of us believed we would see him alive. No one was expecting a resurrection. And that's where our story actually begins. You ready? John tells us this. And John got this information from the source because John was a follower of Jesus who lost faith like everybody else did when Jesus was crucified. Here's where the story begins. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. Early on the first day of the week, the Sabbath ends when the sun begins to come up. Early on the first day, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Now, Mary Magdalene was a person that, Je a woman that Jesus had healed. And when he healed her, she became a Jesus follower. And she was one of those people that had high hopes for Jesus, that he was in fact everything he claimed to be, that he was in fact the long awaited for Messiah. And she woke up early that morning and even though her heart was broken, even though none of this made sense, she was so grateful for what Jesus had done for her, she decided to go to the tomb and see if somehow she could get someone or a lot of someones to move that stone so that she could re-embalm or re-prepare his body for burial. Now, this is just my theory. I think she felt like it needed to be redone because a couple of men did it in a hurry before the sun set for Sabbath. But for whatever reason, she decides to go to the tomb because she's all mourned out, she's extraordinarily grateful, and here's the most important part. She expected to find a body. John tells us that when she got there, she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now, what was her assumption? He's alive, he's risen from the dead? No. Mary assumed that someone had broken into the tomb and stolen the body. Do you know why? Because she was not a superstitious person because she was not expecting a resurrection. Nobody expected no body. So the text tells us, so she came. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. Now, this is interesting. John writes this and he writes himself into the narrative as the one that Jesus loved, which is kind of obvious. He, I mean, it's just strange. He doesn't say his name. He says Peter's name and he doesn't say me. He says the one that Jesus loved. Now, I think perhaps this was John's way of saying to the rest of the disciples, you realize, of course, that I was his favorite. 
for God so liked the rest of you, but for God so loved me. So anyway, John's writing this, he's getting this information from Mary Magdalene. So Mary sees an empty tomb. She does not say, he's alive, he's alive. She runs all the way back to the city. She runs into the house where Peter and John, because they're not up early, they're not at the tomb, they're afraid because they know this. If they came for Jesus, they're probably gonna come for us. And if they could get Jesus, certainly they could get us. And everybody knows that we are his followers, even though Peter denied being Jesus' followers, one of Jesus' followers right after he was arrested. So she burst through the door. It is early in the morning. The sun's just coming up. And here's what she says. Not he's risen, he's alive. She says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Now, again, we don't know what she was assuming, but it would not have been out of, out of line to think that she assumed this. Jesus had a lot of enemies, a lot of enemies. They hated, I mean, come on. They hated Jesus so much that they lied about him and paid witnesses to have him not just killed, not just imprisoned, crucified. And she knew, like Peter and John knew, that if his enemies, or when his enemies discovered that Pilate had allowed someone to take that body and bury it properly, it would not be beyond Jesus' enemies to hire somebody to break into that tomb, take that body, and completely desecrate that body so that no respect could ever be given to that body. And the last thing they wanted was for that tomb, that place where Jesus was buried, to become a shrine where people came and gathered and tried to keep the dream alive and the memories alive of Jesus. So when they saw an empty tomb, of course, they assumed the worst. And in Mary's mind, this story is just getting worse and worse and worse. First, he allowed himself to be taken you know, as a prisoner. Then he allowed himself to be tried and then crucified. And now someone has stolen the body. Well, Peter and John don't know what to think, so they get up and they run through the city and they run out the gate and they run to the place where Jesus was buried and they look into that empty tomb and there's nobody there. And neither of them concluded in that moment that Jesus had come back to life. They run all the way there, they look in the tomb, and then they go back into the city because they don't know what to do. They don't know what to think. They don't know what to believe. But meanwhile, Mary Magdalene slowly makes her way back to the tomb, and she stays there. And when she told John this story, here's what she said. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, literally weeping. Imagine the emotion. This man changed my life. This man changed my life and then he was crucified. Here was the, here was the greatest man that has ever lived. Here's the, the man who touched people no one would touch, who spent time with people no one would spend time with and he was crucified. Again, he wasn't just exiled, he was crucified. And now they won't even leave his body alone. Where do I turn? What do I do? God didn't come through. It didn't work out. Who can I trust? And as she wept, this is so powerful. As she wept, she bent over and she looked into the tomb. Now, Peter and John have just been there and they've left. She's finally made her way back. She looks into the tomb and she saw two angels in white. She doesn't know they're angels. Seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And these angels ask Mary Magdalene a question that resolves a centuries-old question. And the question is, are angels men or women? Are angels male or female? They ask her, woman, why are you crying? So we know angels are men, because only a man would ask a woman, why are you crying? Just a little resurrection humor there in the story. Anyway. So they say to her, woman, why are you crying? And listen to what she says, she's just heartbroken. Imagine, I mean, this is just gut-wrenching wrenching drama. She says, they have taken, again, nobody thinks Jesus rose from the dead. She still believes there were grave robbers. And the thing is, grave robbers usually take things from a body. Who would steal a body unless they had evil intentions, unless they were gonna desecrate and show disrespect for that body? They've taken my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And then she hears something stirring behind her. And John says this, at this, this is so powerful, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Now, we don't know if because it was still dark. We don't know because it was shaded. We don't know because of the distance. We don't know because he looked different, but she sees Jesus and she doesn't recognize him and she turns right back around and keeps staring into the tomb. But I think Jesus has a huge grin on his face because he knows she is moments away from everything being made new. Because if Jesus is alive, every 
thing about everything changes. And the knowledge that he is alive was about to change everything for her. So with a grin on his face, he asked her the same question the angels asked, but he gives her a clue to the fact that maybe she should pay attention to what's going on around her. She's staring into the empty tomb. And from behind, he says, woman, why are you crying? And he sees her staring into the tomb. And then he says, and I'm sure he's having to just kind of withhold his emotion as well, when he says, who is it you're looking for? And then John tells us, and I think this is one of the hilarious moments in the gospels that we don't think is funny because when we read the Bible, we read it so seriously. Thinking he was the gardener. Now, exactly. I think Mary told this story for the rest of her life because people would say, Mary, you're Mary Magdalene. You were one of the first to look into the empty tomb. Mary, tell us your story. I mean, she told this story until she was an old woman. Everybody wanted to hear this story. And I think when she got to this part of the story, she would say, you're not gonna believe it. I'm staring into the tomb. I'm talking to this guy behind me. And I thought he was the gardener and everybody laughs. And do you know why she thought he was the gardener? Because nobody expected a resurrection and even when they were looking into an empty tomb, no one assumed that Jesus was alive. They expected him to stay dead. And she said, sir, if you have carried him away, if you know where he is, would you tell me and I will go and get him. And she's staring into the empty tomb and she's talking to this gentleman over her shoulder. And Jesus says, I love this, Mary, Mary, Mary. And when she hears her name and when she hears that voice, she puts it together and everything changes. And the text says this, because she told John this. And she turned toward him and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. We know the word rabbi. And she runs toward Jesus. Of course she does. And Jesus says, and we don't understand why he said this, but he does. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. And then he gives her instructions. Now this is so important. I'll tell you why in just a second. He says, go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father. I love this. And your father to my my God and to your God, a God. In other words, Mary, I know you've already been to the city once. I need you to go back to the city. And this time you're not gonna tell them that the tomb has been opened and you don't know where the body is. This time you have a completely different message. And Mary Magdalene went to, um, to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. Whoo. Let me tell you why this is such a big deal. You see, in the ancient world and in the first century, women had no credibility at all, zero. A woman could not testify in court. If you brought a witness to court and it was a woman, everybody just laughed, she wasn't even allowed to testify. Women had no credibility. If you were making this up, if you were trying to fabricate a story about something you wanted people to believe in the first century, you would not have a woman be a witness to anything because no one takes that seriously. But do you know why in the gospels, all the gospels tell us that the women saw Jesus first and told the men, do you know why the gospels say it that way? That's what happened. I have seen the Lord. God has come through. Jesus is who he said he was. We can continue to trust. Death has been arrested. Our lives are beginning again. And although nothing in the world had changed and nothing in her circumstances had changed, everything had changed because Jesus was alive and that changed everything for her. And my friends, that changes everything for us as well. It is the context for every decision. It is the context for every relationship. It is the context for everything we do with our time, the way we dream, the way we plan, the way we treat other people, that Jesus is alive. Because of the resurrection, think about this, because of the resurrection, you can pray knowing that God hears your prayers because the same Jesus that came back to life is the same Jesus that tells you and tells me, when you pray, you pray as if God is your father 
And when you pray, you can pray knowing that God knows exactly what you need even before you ask, but God wants you to ask him anyway because that's what good fathers do. And you can pray knowing that God hears your prayers because Jesus said when you pray in private, God hears your secret prayers and will reward you openly. And the reason you can believe that is not simply because Jesus said it, and you certainly don't believe that just because it's in the Bible. You believe it because Jesus rose from the dead and substantiated and punctuated everything he taught, everything he said. See, it's because of the resurrection that you can live knowing there's life beyond this life because it's Jesus that taught us about heaven. Did you know that before Jesus came along, most Jewish people thought that when you died, that was it, it's over. All the pagans thought that when you died, that was it, it's over. It's Jesus who introduced us into the idea, introduced us to the idea of eternal life. Not eternal life because people will remember you eternally. Eternal life in a different kind of life, a quality of life. It was Jesus that said to his disciples, I am going to prepare a place for you and I'm gonna come back for you that you can be with me someday. And none of that made sense and none of that was believable until he rose from the dead. And suddenly all of that made sense and all of that was something a person can believe. It means that every time you attend a funeral of a Christian, every time you bury someone you love, there is hope. Not because the Bible says so, but because Jesus rose from the dead. And do you know what else it means, the resurrection? For some of you, those of you who are students, this is so extraordinarily important. It means that you can sacrifice knowing that your faithfulness matters. That when you say no to opportunities and when you say no to income and when you say no to friends and when you say no to things that you feel like everyone else is gonna think I'm a fool, you can sacrifice for your savior and your faithfulness counts because Jesus throughout his ministry taught that what you do in this life matters in eternity and that what you do in this life and your faithfulness to God in this life is something that God keeps track of and you will be rewarded. This is one of the biggest themes in Jesus' teachings and it's also one of the most misunderstood themes. But Jesus said faithfulness matters because I am paying attention and your heavenly father values faithfulness especially when it costs you something. But here's the best news of all. Because of the resurrection, because Jesus rose from the dead, if you have never put your faith in Christ as your savior, you should consider it. Because the issue isn't what the church has done. And the issue isn't the Christians you've met. The issue is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The issue is always, 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 always. If it was just the two of us over coffee or over dinner, I would end our conversation this way. I would say, please remember, no matter what you decide, please remember, no matter what you think about what I've just said, please remember this. There's really just one issue. Who is Jesus? And on Easter, that question was answered. He is exactly who he claimed to be. Savior and Lord and worth your consideration. That's why I love, love, love the lyrics to this song that we've sung for the last few months. And think about these lyrics. Many of you have sung this song so many times, you know these lyrics. Think about these lyrics now with Mary Magdalene standing there in between, because that's where we live, we live in between. We live with the sorrow and we live with the hopelessness and we live with the disappointment, but she's just minutes away from all of that looking and feeling completely, completely different. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. So what do you do about sin? What do you do about the past? What do you do about the shame? What do you do about the regret? Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope and no place to begin. How do you re-begin when it's just you? Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began. Our lives begin, our lives begin, not simply when we take our first breath. Our lives begin when we understand that Jesus is who Jesus says he is because he came not only to give us a different kind of life, he came to be the context for our entire life. But this is my favorite part. Ash was redeemed. See, at the center of the gospel, at the center of what we believe is this word redeemed, it means that God takes things that other people don't think have any value and he gives them value. God takes your past that you're ashamed of and he gives it value. God takes your biggest mistakes and your biggest blunders and those weekends and those weeks and those seasons of life that you are so ashamed of and he redeems them and he gives them value. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains and our orphan hearts were given a name, Mary, Mary. 
when death was arrested and life began. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the men and women that, oh my gosh, they sacrificed so much that these narratives, these texts, these scriptures, these stories would survive the centuries. And here we are, still enamored, infatuated, just absorbed in the details of these texts. Father, I pray that it wouldn't simply be the fact of the resurrection that we celebrate. It would be the implications. And that we would understand that our lives are lived within the context of a God who loves us, invited us to call us him Father, of a Savior who died for us and rose from the dead to give us hope every single day in every single facet of our lives. So please take what we've heard tonight and just wrap it around our hearts and give us wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard and give us the courage to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to death. When death was arrested. so much for being with us. We start a brand new series next week. We'd love to have you back. Have an awesome rest of the day with your families. We love you.